Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much. For those of you uh, I didn't get a chance to speak to you yesterday, my name is Johanna Trieg. Um, as Paul said, I'm ECB correspondent at Market News International. We are a financial newswire that uh, is part of Deutsche Börse, and we focus on debt markets and central banks and uh, trying to keep our clients up to date with um, developments in the real economy and to, to give them insights into thinking of central banking. And um, so I covered the ECB essentially since the collapse of Lehman and followed the central bankers around um, throughout the sovereign debt crisis. And would like to talk a little bit about where we stand right now in terms of the economy in Europe and what we're likely to see in terms of uh, ECB action. Um, As we all know, um, the major economies, um, advanced economies, uh, have struggled to emerge from the Great Recession, and um, the euro area has underperformed significantly. Um, you know, the UK and the US have recovered uh, quite significantly, while output in the euro area is still fairly close to levels we saw in 2008. Um, and in some member states, it's even below that still. And we're not just talking about Greece here, but also countries like Finland or Italy. Um, and the ECB is not really expecting um, Europe to uh, catch up very fast. Um, what you see here is um, the staff projection, the ECB's projection for GDP. Earlier this month, they. Uh, they cut those from 2% um, seen uh, in July to 1.8% to by 2017. Um, the outlook for inflation, um, which arguably is even more important, of course, for the ECB since that's their target, isn't um, any more optimistic. And again, they cut uh, the forecast uh, for 2017 earlier this month uh, to one7 from 1.8 previously. And while that might seem like a very minor revision, it's important because at 1.8, the ECB um, is right on target of meeting its price stability uh, mandate uh, over the medium term. At 1.7, we are already on a slippery slope. Um, and if there's gonna be another downward revision, we are no longer in what the ECB uh, considers its target. Um, and that would then significantly uh, increase uh, the likelihood of them boosting stimulus further. Um, and in fact, President um, Mario Draghi has warned earlier um, when, when presenting these forecasts that um, there's a significant chance that they will be revised downward further. Um, the cutoff date um, for these projections was, July, uh, was August 12th. Um, and so before concerns of, about China um, really intensified and the Chinese authorities devalued their currency. Um, so, um, and in addition to that, I think uh, what's also important to remember is that um, over the last couple of years, uh, the EC, when the ECB uh, forecasted inflation, Far more often than not, they, the actual outcome was worse than the projection, and um, they had to, uh, had to revise forecasts down much more frequently than they actually revised them upwards. Um, and so um, investors also don't seem to be convinced that the ECB is going to be able to, to meet its inflation target in the um, near future or even in the medium term, um, what you see here is the five-year, five-year forward inflation swaps. That's the ECB's favorite measure of uh, inflation expectations. Um, and it's investors' bets on what the inflation rate will be starting five years from now in five years. And what you can see historically, that rate has always been well above um, 2%. Uh, and even here in 2010, when headline inflation was negative, it just dipped below 2% very briefly. And it's only been recently that it's really come down significantly. Um, and uh, President Draghi, in, in, over the summer 2014, around here, warned the first time about 
um, concerns of, over inflation expectations. Um, and at that point, it stood at like 1.95%. And as you can see, it kept going down, hitting a trough at 1.4%, then slightly recovered after the ECB announced quantitative easing, but it has come down again. Um, and is certainly well below um, the central bank's uh, uh, comfort measure. And that's despite the ECB being relatively active, certainly very active in their own view. Um, you see here is their balance sheet, and um, you can see here how they've, you know, they announced a quantitative easing program um, and started to buy um, government bonds, 60 billion a month, which they're intending to do. Um, for at least, six, uh, until at least September 2016. But in light of the new situation and the renewed downside risk that the central bank has uh, identified, uh, stemming from China, a stronger exchange rate and weak commodity prices, Draghi has signaled that um, the ECB stands ready to boost the balance sheet even more aggressively. Um, if that is uh, deemed necessary to ensure them meeting their price stability mandate. So now the key question is, will it be necessary? Um, what we've seen since their meeting in September, um, in terms of uh, data from the real economy, um, wouldn't really have changed their assessment so far. Um, most of the data has, has, has predated China concerns, um, but has been relatively positive. Um, today, actually, a couple of, like half an hour ago, we saw the German EFO index um, coming out stronger, um, but that's likely going to be temporary because it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't have the Volkswagen scandal yet. But um, the PMIs were relatively resilient as well. So um, that wouldn't have really changed their, their assessment. Um, the situation in China, they're still concerned, but um, again, they think it's too early to draw any firm conclusions. Um, and commodity prices are still weak, but haven't changed significantly. Um, so the most striking difference um, from that we've seen since, um, since the September policy meeting is certainly the decision by the US Federal Reserve not to raise interest rates. Um, for the ECB, it's, it's been very important to underline uh, that there's a divergence in terms of monetary policy, um, and that they stand at very different parts of the cycle, hoping that that will uh, eventually bring down the exchange rate even further and faster. Um, and that hasn't happened. It hasn't realized. And um, I think that's also what you saw, saw in terms of market developments when um, going into the Fed meeting, when investors started scaling back expectations of a rate hike, the euro rose, sort of peaked on the decision, and then you started having speculation about the ECB easing again, um, so somewhat bringing, uh, bringing down the euro. Um, and I think certainly that's, you know, it's if the, the um, Fed decides to um, not act um, in October, that significantly raises the chances of ECB action a month later in, in, um, in December. I think in, for both the um, October and the December meeting, the ECB will meet before the Fed. Um, so Draghi spoke yesterday actually in the European Parliament um, and he said, you know, it's too early to, to, uh, um, to draw any firm conclusions um, on whether they'll act and when they will act. Um, nevertheless, I think there are a number of good reasons to assume that um, if there will be further easing, we're not going to see that in October. Um, number one is when you speak to, to policymakers in, in, in private discussions, if for, you know, for a long time given you... Um, the story that you know they have, there's a strong sense that the best that they can really do at this point to to promote the recovery in the euro area is to uh, give a sense of, of confidence and not add uh, additional nervousness into financial markets by playing around uh, with policy and um, I think that that the reaction to the Fed's decision not to raise interest rates will certainly have re re reinforced that assessment um, that. Um, if you know a steady hand and, and predictive, predictive policies is is the better way to go. Um, a second issue is um, that we are in a very we are in a very different situation today 
um, than we were in at the start of the year in 2000, um, in, in January when, when the ECB decided to launch its quantitative easing program. Um, and that is because core inflation has stabilized. Um, at the start of the year, you see that um, um, it was it still went down and now it's gone up towards 1%. And that significantly limits uh, the concern on, on um, on the governing council that we could see risks of deflation. Um, Bundesbank president uh, Jens Weidmann essentially commenting on this graph says, you know, any discussion today about um, e easing policy further would essentially be a discussion about trying to influence commodity prices. Um, and um, as we know, that's something that traditionally at least central banks have acknowledged that they can't really influence. Um, but we also know, of course, that Weidmann um, is not a fan of QE and would find arguments against uh, boosting policy support. Uh, but he's not the only one who's, who's pointed to this uh, core inflation as a sign of comfort. Vice President uh, Vito Constancio, who's very, uh, very much on the dovish side of the governing council, has also pointed this out. Um, so I think, you know, in this, in this sort of environment, securing um, a broad majority for further action um, will need to have more conclusive evidence and more, more data um, to, to, to get policymakers to, to back action. And um, that will be available only in, this, in the December meeting in form of the new ECB staff forecast that will become available then. Um, and they'll be coming back to that 1.7 versus 1.6 percent inflation forecast, and um, if we see uh, a downward revision, then um, I think you know we will likely see further policy easing. Um, and finally, as I said earlier, the um, the um, ECB is meeting before the Fed, and they might also hope they can just sit this one out and hope that the the, the Fed will do the job for them. Um, and if the Fed then raises interest rates in October that might remove or at least mitigate their need to, to act. They could try and you know, wait and see how things develop, or uh, if they add the stimulus, it might be um, less aggressive than otherwise. Um, I think what we will see going into, you know, in the next couple of weeks going into the meeting, um, there, there's likely to be some level of confusion in terms of uh, communication. Um, if you, if you follow the, the, the policy makers, in like just yesterday, for example, you had two executive board members speaking, or Draghi and an executive board member, um, the chief economist, Peter Pratt, and you had two governing council members speak. Um, the executive board sounds um, far more dovish. Uh, Draghi uh, repeated numerous times that the ECB is ready, willing, and able to act. Um, and those are the same words that his chief economist used. Um, while the two governing council members um, emphasized that it's far too early to take any decisions. Um, one of them even said, we haven't even talked about boosting stimulus. Um, and if you speak to, to a number of, we've spoken to a number of them on background, um, and again, that's much more the sense that they convey that it's much too early, um, that there's a lot of stimulus in the pipeline. I mean, every month they're adding 60 billion. Um, so they think, you know, you just have to give this time. Um, but I think the experience that we've seen since Draghi come, came into office, um, he tends to get what he wants. Um, he doesn't get it immediately. He might have to uh, wait a meeting or two. But in the end, the, the, he's, he's managed to get, um, to push through his, his, his uh, preferences. Um, so... If they decide to act, um, what can they do? Um, another executive board member, Eve Mersch, said, you know, we, QE is not the only option. We can, um, we can do more credit easing. Credit easing is what they referred to as um, when, they, when they gave um, a lot of liquidity to banks. I mean, this is what you see here. That was their main policy tool earlier in the crisis, giving unlimited liquidity to banks for, on very cheap. 
Um, in fact, we have another um, of these long-term liquidity operations. Just today, the results should come out at um, 11.50. Uh, and there are like trade, I think forecasts from traders are around 50 billion. What I hear is that it's going to be significantly less and more in the, around 15 to, to 20 billion. So um, while they like to point out that that's an option, um, banks don't seem to be terribly interesting and uh, interested in picking up the money. Um, interest rates is an interesting one um, because Draghi uh, late last year said we're done with interest rates. Um, and he stressed that we, we're not, they're not even able to do any technical adjustments anymore. Um, but when he was asked about the possibility of interest rate cuts at his last press conference, he just said the option hadn't been discussed. Um, which is very different in terms of the rhetoric. Um, I spoke to, to one executive board member immediately afterwards because I wondered what's going on. Um, they said they've also noted the change in language, but they hadn't discussed it. Um, they hadn't discussed any change in, in, in their stance towards moving on interest rates. Um, but again, this wouldn't be the first time that sort of Draghi raises, raises uh, a policy option, sort of creates expectations in the markets, and then eventually gets the rest of the governing council to back him. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one to watch. And then the most obvious choice is still quantitative easing, um, either boosting it, um, buying more, uh, or um, buying for longer. Uh, in terms of the public comments that they've made, um, buying for longer is what they, mention, they, they tend to mention first. Um, in the sense, it's easier for them because they've all, always kept the door open. Uh, to doing that, they also like the idea because uh, it cements their forward guidance and give, clearly gives the sense of the divergence between the ECB and, um, and the Fed. Um, and it also limits, limits the risk of um, you know, new concerns arising about the ECB actually not finding enough assets to buy. Um, on the other hand, um, you could say, you know, what's the point? The program is, you know, the program is going for another year in any case. Um, and actually accelerating the bond, the bond purchases now would be more effective. Um, I don't know what the state of discussion is right now, whether there are any preferences on the governing council. I mean, you've heard sort of the pros and cons arguments, but I haven't heard anything that would suggest that there's a leaning right now already towards one or the other option. Um, so yeah, but yeah, what does that mean? Like for, for that's, that's, you know, in the next couple of months, I think uh, in the broader sense, um, um, you, for the euro area economy, we're likely, the recovery is weak. According to the ECB, what we've seen is, what we see, even that, that weak recovery that we're in right now is just a cyclical recovery that's driven by monetary policy uh, and not sustainable. Um, and, you know, if you look at the ECB star forecasts again, while their forecast uh, grows in 2017 to be stronger than in 2016, you already see the quarterly growth rates slowing down in, in, in 2017. And uh, according to the ECB, Peter Pratt told us that, um, you know, again, this is because of, mainly because of the waning impact of um, oil prices and the weak currency, so again, monetary policy. Um, so you've got that, and at the same time, you know, you still have the, um, the flaws of the uh, European architecture. Um, and I think, like, a lot of people are familiar with this chart during the crisis that shows, you know, the, the euro area economies uh, diverging, uh, making it almost impossible for the ECB to, to, make, uh, to, to devise a policy that's good for all of the member states. Um, but what the, actually the bigger worry is um, that this actually does not seem to be a feature of the crisis. It's now gotten the, the, the attention, but a recent study by the ECB actually showed that the 12 founding members, the real economies of the 12 founding members of the euro, have um, diverged since adopting the common currency. 
So this is a more fundamental problem. Um, and you know, unless there really is going to be massive reform and integration of the euro area, um, this problem is going to stay with us. So um, the height of the sovereign debt crisis is over, but the viability question still hasn't really been answered. And I think Draghi used very strong words on that issue, um, especially for somebody who says it's inconceivable that a country would leave the currency union. When speaking about Greece here, he's speaking about the union exploding, essentially. So, um, and of course, so you'll, you'll hear him, you've heard him, um, and also the other central bankers at G20 just, again, reiterated their call on governments to do more and not to rely on central banks uh, too much, but in practice, I think what that means for the ECB is that, you know, growth and inflation is going to be very weak. Um, the ECB will remain on an easing bias, uh, and the exit is uh, very far off. Um, so the train is out of the tunnel, but it's not running very fast. And uh, while the ECB is going to continue to throw its calls, um, we really need a new engine. But uh, whether that's going to happen or not, uh, I guess it's up to governments. Thank you very much.